singular pleasure to host this event at the Go Arts and Literature Festival. We're coming towards the end now, and it's going to be very lovely, and I hope all of you stay through uh, the event that follows, which is the launch of uh, Jerry Pinto's um, translations from Tukaram and then the Stuthi Choir. But this is a particularly uh, important and special event because we are releasing a wonderful book called The Cobra's Gaze, Exploring India's Wild Heritage. And it is with Stephen Alter, who is uh, in many ways a remarkable and unique literary figure of India because not only has he written outstanding novels, uh, uh, one of the best memoirs, I think, a book that I'm very devoted to, which is about growing up, it's called All the Way Up to Heaven, it's about growing up um, in Landar um, in a unique circumstance. Um, Steve Alter also ha has uh, almost uniquely, I think he may be, I, I think it's possible uh, to make the case that he has seen more of the Himalaya than any other living human because he has literally tramped the extent of it and unlike many, most Indians, he has ex gone all the way through Pakistan also and he's also uh, traversed the other end which is where our own Nandani Velio spends a considerable amount of time. So um, that is a remarkable thing. I highly, I urge you, I'm a huge fan fan of, uh, of uh, Steve, um, and uh, I love all of his books. I strongly urge you to purchase the travelogues as well as the novels, um, and certainly the Cobra's Gaze. Thank you so much, Steve, for coming here to launch this. And I'm not going to hugely introduce you to Nandini, because most uh, several of her friends are here. But Nandini is someone we are inordinately, inordinately proud of, not just in Goa, but in Panjim. She is uh, from Panjim, uh, from uh, a family which is very connected to Panjim, but she has a, an absolute star um, who has, among other things, at a time when the rest of the country was uh, preoccupied under lockdown, um, and uh, the older generation of people who have defended Goa for a generation were kind of maybe preoccupied. Nandini has led the awesome Save Mole, Amche Molem campaign, uh, which. Uh, which has set a model for the rest of the world, really, in a kind of an asymmetric approach using art, literature, every means possible to win hearts, minds, souls. And uh, part of her, uh, her heart and mind and soul is also in the Himalaya. This is something you share in common. Thank you so much, Nandini. She was in actually Arunachal Pradesh and uh, took on this assignment because I knew that when we had the opportunity to have Steve Walter's book, it should be read by the right person from here to do it justice. So thank you so much, both of you, for doing this. Please take over, Nandini. Thanks, Vivek. Um, just back at home, everyone says that there's never been a bigger fan than Vivek. So thanks, actually, for always having our back and um, having me here. And it get, gives me a great pleasure, actually, to um, introduce Steve, uh, because Steve is one of those people who has like a bookshelf full of his own books. And similar uh, to Goa, he lives in Masuri. Um, and I just, my first question to see Steve would be, like you probably get the question about um, what is Masuri home or is it a holiday similar to something that I often get asked about being Goan? Well, um Thank you, uh, Nandini. Thank you, Vivek, first of all, for uh, inviting me here and uh, everyone at GALF for hosting me as part of this and my special thanks to Nandini. Uh, this session really should be a conversation with her uh, because of all of her work uh, connected to conservation, communities, and landscapes, and her activism. Masuri you were asking me whether it's home or a holiday. Well, I think a home can be a holiday too. But uh, at the same time, I think that for me, I mean, I say I'm from Missouri. Uh, I do spend a certain amount of time in the town of Missouri, but I spend more time outside the town wandering uh, through the mountains of that area. And uh, for me, the landscape itself is really home. Uh, whether it's the trees, whether it's the wildlife, whether it's the birds that are there. Um, I, I always say that I, I run away from the rhesus macaques, the tourists, <laughs> and the dogs, because there are too many of them 
uh, in the town. And so for me, home is really in the mountains, uh, away from uh, the hill station itself. Uh, but my home is now partly in Goa as well. We spend uh, at least three to four months of the year here in Goa as well. Uh, so I'm also very aware between traversing between Masuri and Goa and also vast parts of the Himalaya uh, that we kind of live in a sensory bubble, right? Um, where uh, we have a certain way of looking and we have a certain way of uh, seeing the world. Um, but do you see that there are like pitfalls of being uh, seen as green literature, or say green activists or green writers? Or do you see that we have a niche that is important to fulfill um, on its own? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's an interesting question because I think there's, a, there's always a certain amount of pressure on you if you're a nature writer or a um, uh, somebody who's writing about wildlife or conservation, whatever it is, is the pressure is that you have to have a message. Uh, and of course, all of us have a message one way or the other. But it, it's like asking a novelist, what's your theme? Uh, and I've never believed in themes in fiction. I mean, I think we tell a story, and those who read our books find the themes and thread them together and analyze them in that way. And I think as a nature writer, it's the same thing. I don't start with a message. Um, I start more with the experience. I like to, whatever I write uh, comes out of personal experience. And then I read a lot of books alongside that, and hopefully, at the end of it, what I describe, the experiences I have, uh, the different species I encounter, uh, all of that sort of adds up to convincing a reader that this is something worth saving. But I'm not trying to go in there saying, let's, let's, let's save the caracal or let's save the great bustard or whatever it might be. Uh, I, I, I hope that comes out of the stories I tell. Uh, rather than being a sort of didactic, uh, uh, you know, hit you on the head message uh, in that way. Yeah. So actually, I have um, a copy of Steve's book before the release itself because I've kind of gone through the book and made some of my notes, especially about uh, the way he looks at uh, the natural world. And there's, um, I think in chapter two of the book, you talk about the naturalist tra trance and how that is very similar to that of the devotee and the deity or the uh, predator and the prey. And how there is often uh, integration of both of these sensory realities. Um, so what has that trance been uh, for you across these chapters and what has uh, emerged from them? Well, there's a phrase that has always fascinated me ever since I read it in a book about 15, 20 years ago uh, called the hunter's trance. And the idea of the hunter's trance is that uh, at that moment where the hunter pulls the bow string back and is about to release the arrow, uh, there is a connection with the target or the prey or whatever it may be. And before that arrow is released, there is this sort of moment of connectedness between the two, the hunter and his prey. Now, E.O. Wilson, uh, the famous ecologist from Harvard, took that idea and then changed it to the naturalist's gaze or the naturalist's trance. And it, it's, an, it's an almost mystical experience, and it's very difficult to explain. Uh, I, Actually, the genesis of this book was a moment where I was walking in the Jabberkate Nature Reserve near my home. And uh, I was looking for a particular species of plant, an insectivorous plant, uh, Drosera peltata, which feeds off minuscule little flies. And so my, I was walking through the forest on my own, and my attention was entirely on the ground. But there was a moment where I suddenly realized that I wasn't alone. And I looked up, and through the fork of a tree in front of me, there was a goral, a uh, goat antelope, a mountain goat, uh, not more than three meters away from me. 
and he had been feeding on the grass as well, and he looked up at the same moment, and our eyes locked. Our eyes locked probably for about 20 seconds or so. Uh, it felt much longer. But it was, uh, it was a truly profound experience because in a sense, at least I like to think, I don't know what the guru thought of it, but I like to think that there was a shared consciousness. We were both conscious of our surroundings. We were conscious of our place on Earth. And in those few seconds, uh, we connected in that way. And that, to me, has sort of was, a, was an experience that I used as I traveled uh, and visited many wildlife sanctuaries uh, throughout India, is the idea that I'm looking at those species, but they're also looking at me. And the question is, why am I looking at them? Am I just looking at them to be able to boast that I saw a tiger uh, or I saw a swamp deer or whatever it may be? Or am I looking for something more important, some sort of connection between my species and these, these other species that I'm encountering in that way. Everybody talks about going to a national park or a tiger reserve and having a sighting. It's, it's a strange word, a sighting. Um, did you get a sighting of a tiger? Oh no, I went there and I didn't get a sighting and all of that. Well, I always say that tigers get a whole lot more sightings of us uh, than we get of them in that way. And I often wonder, what, what is it that that creature is experiencing, encountering? Just to finish off, the title, The Cobra's Gaze, there's, there's a certain irony uh, in that. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll be totally honest with you. I gave the book this title uh, to... Uh, persuade, I thought it was a sexy title that my publishers would then agree to. And of course, then I was in a quandary because I had to see a cobra. And uh, as time went by, I wasn't seeing any cobras. And I thought to myself, now I'm going to have to change the title. But eventually, I did see enough cobras to justify the title. But the irony with the cobra, when the cobra looks at you, is that it doesn't have very good eyesight. In fact, Snakes don't have uh, good eyesight. Uh, herpetologists like Rahul Alvarez, who's sitting here, would tell you that if a king cobra rises up in front of you, don't move. And if it goes between your legs, don't move. Of course, I'm never going to do that. But uh, nevertheless, its eyesight isn't what is registering your presence. Its eyesight isn't what is interpreting the world around it as much as its tongue. And through its tongue, it's pick picking up scent particles that give it a sense of what else is in its vicinity, uh, perhaps where there's danger, where there's a mate, whatever it may be. And that being able to read the world through its tongue is something that um, I think is, is, for me, almost incomprehensible. I keep thinking about it. I keep trying to decide, how does this work? Uh, we know, of course, that it takes the scent particles, touches them to the roof of its mouth. The uh, Jacobson's organ, which is located there, then sends the signals to the brain, and it finds uh, where it's going. But what's really going on, I'm not sure. And that, to me, is one of the enigmas that is in the heart of this book. Uh, this book doesn't have a lot of answers. It has a whole lot of enigmas and puzzles and perhaps half answers uh, as I explored uh, wild places and wild creatures in India. Yeah, actually I was also uh, kind of uh, confused about how did the cobra's gaze, how did it, how did it get its name? Um, and I was like, snakes can't see very well, but you, I actually marked it here on page 36, figuring out that actually if you were talking about that the snake studies its environment through its tongue and maybe you wanted to write, or it was a metaphor of sorts, yeah? Um, yeah. Well, one, one of the things, that, I'm sorry to interrupt you on that, um, I spent 
a fair amount of time in Agumbe at the Rainforest Research Station there with uh, Ajay Giri, who's the field director. And we were talking a lot about how these snakes register the presence of other snakes, uh, particularly during the breeding season. And he says, of course, they can, whatever, whatever it is, the pheromones or whatever they're picking up on their tongues, will tell them that there is a female uh, snake, a uh, female king cobra that is ready uh, to mate. But as Ajay said, they cross the path and they know that the snake has gone across there. But he said, how do they know that the snake went right or to the left? Uh, to me, that's, I mean, the snake isn't there. Uh, unlike uh, your Irula uh, snake catchers who can tell you whether the snake has gone into the a hole or come out of the hole. Rahul was telling us about this yesterday. Uh, this, the cobra, how does it know to turn right to pursue its mate uh, rather than turning left? These are questions that, that fascinate me uh, and I don't have answers for them, but I think they, they are the sort of thing that herpetologists, uh, wildlife scientists are asking about a number of different species uh, throughout India. Actually, so coming to the part about um, asking questions and knowing species before you know their names, which is something that often happens, right? You look at a species and you um, see it in a book, you see it in a bird book, or you see it in a snake book, and you say, okay, I know a lot about the species. What is your take about um, whether you should just know names of species um, and the lyricality and also the fun that is associated with it versus many people saying that we should not know names of species. We should experience the world for how we see it and how we look at it. Well, I think names, names are important and names are fascinating. And whether it's Latin names or common names, uh, each of them or many of them contain a story in and of itself. Um, but I will admit that I've been often with uh, bird watchers who are much more knowledgeable than me in the forest, and there's a certain point at which all they are speaking is Latin, and I don't understand a word that's going on there. Uh, and then to make it even worse, most of the common names for the birds that I learned when I was uh, 20 or 21 have now been changed. So yet again, I'm, I'm in the dark there. But I think that to me what is more important is learning the stories that are behind each of those species. And um, in the book, uh, and one of the things that uh, I, I spent a very uh, a considerable amount of time on was looking at the way in which human beings interpret other species by giving them names, but also by representing them. For instance, if some of you have been to Pimbetka in Madhya Pradesh, where you can see the rock art, uh, uh, prehistoric rock art, in which numerous species have been drawn uh, and painted on these caves. Those artists, those hunter-gatherers who painted them certainly didn't know the Latin names. They must have had some name for each of these creatures. But what's fascinating is on those walls, you can recognize each of those species. Uh, there's one that's referred to as the zoo rock. There are 19 different species of mammals on that rock. And the depictions of those show us not only the morphology, the physical characteristics of that species, but also something of its behavior. And those prehistoric drawings, I like to think of them as the first field guides to Indian mammals, because those hunters were depicting them on the walls. We don't know why. I suspect it was to be able to boast about the animals they hunted, uh, there may be a spiritual element to it as well, uh, praying for success in the hunt, um, or perhaps, and, and there, are, there are certain embellishments like all good hunting stories uh, on those walls. There's an enormous boar uh, chasing a hunter, uh, and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful image uh, with a lot of humor in it. It's, it's one of those sort of slapstick uh, cartoons on the wall there. But, those artists understood these animals firsthand. And naturalists today, 
if you go to um, Bimbedka, what's fascinating is there are a number of species depicted there that are no longer found in Madhya Pradesh. The wild buffaloes, elephants, well, elephants have come back into a corner of Madhya Pradesh, but there are a number of species that aren't there anymore. So it tells us that their distribution has changed over time. Uh, the same goes for petroglyphs in Ladakh. Uh, the uh, etchings on the rocks in Ladakh, you can recognize the snow leopard, you can recognize the Uriyal, you can recognize the Ibex immediately. And those artists observed these animals very, very carefully. And you can recognize them immediately. Um, and they may look childish as drawings, but there's a lot of information embedded in those and a lot of stories in there as well. Sorry. Thanks. And actually in Steve's book, there are a lot of fun local names, like there was one Chudel Papri. And, or bandar, uh, or bandar, ki roti. Uh, bandar ki roti. And there's also another one that he talks about that I've noticed in my field site. There are like these big orange, uh, big red fruits that you see in the rainforest. And in Assamese, it's called bandar dim, which is like monkey's balls. So you can't yeah. unsee well, it once you see it. You know, the funny thing was when I was told about bandar dim, uh, they, I guess they were being polite. They said, this is monkey's eggs. <laughs> and so I, th I thought, OK, got it. But then when I was in Kaziranga this last week, I was corrected immediately. And they said, no, 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 it's something a little bit more exciting uh, than that. Yeah. So uh, actually, I was speaking to Steve. Uh, before this, we meant to catch up in Kaziranga, where um, he was in a boat, and some of my students went and met him. But he said that this uh, book started in Goa. And that was your first assignment. Can you tell us a bit about it? Uh, absolutely. Um, this was about three years ago, or yeah, about three and a half years ago, actually. I um, got in touch with Omkar Darwadkar, who um, agreed to take me out herping. And for those of you who don't know what herping is, you're, you're pursuing reptiles and uh, amphibians, but really you're looking for anything that moves after dark. And we spent uh, three days in uh, Netravali uh, Wildlife Sanctuary uh, looking for snakes, uh, looking for bats, looking for, as I say, any creature that moved. And it was wonderful because Omkar is so knowledgeable, not just about birds. I mean, birds are his specialty. But um, he, he, he knew all about scorpions. He knew about uh, semi-slugs. He knew about uh, you know, butterflies or whatever it might be. And you mentioned Chirel Papri. One of the interesting things was it was about 9 o'clock, 9.30 at night. We were returning from um, uh, a, a walk through Nature Valley, and we were driving out of the park. Um, and there was a forest department gate there. And as we came to that gate, there was this tremendous blood-curdling scream. I mean, it was just, it was as if somebody had their throat cut. And we looked at each other. And my first instinct was maybe the gate was rusty, and it just made a screeching, screeching sound. But then it was repeated. And both of us flew out of the car from either side. We had our torches. We were looking around. And we couldn't figure out where this sound was coming from and what creature it was at that point. And finally, we saw that it was a what Omkar uh, identified as a spot-bellied uh, eagle owl, um, one of the largest owls in India. Uh, and for Omkar, this was the first time he had seen it in Goa. So he was very excited about that. And it had killed a coil. And we got to watch it for quite a while up above us there. And it screeched several times. And even though we knew the source of the sound, it was really a, a terrifying call. So at the end of it, I asked Omkar, I said, what's the local name for this? And whether he was pulling my leg or not, he said, Churel. Uh, <laughs> it was definitely either a banshee or a, or a witch. Uh, the name had been appropriated to that particular species. And you could tell how those sort of stories, those ghost stories, uh, link to a particular species in the wild. 
yeah. So I have actually had a great time nerding out um, on Steve's book. I was reading it online because I didn't. Uh, I had downloaded a PDF copy because I didn't have network for a bit. Um, and it like for somebody who's already interested in wildlife and interested in uh, natural history, it's a treasure trove. But I just wanted to change gears a bit and um, ask you. Uh, because you do mention in the chapter related to the cheetah, and there's also mention about how Nehru tried to get, um, how there was a conversation between Nehru and Marshal Tito about trying to get some of the white tigers to Siberia and uh, coming to, I think, roughly last year, where uh, Narendra Modi said that with the cheetah project, there is a uh, no irreconcilable differences between ecology and uh, the economy. I just wanted to ask you what your thoughts were uh, with respect to political ecology and uh, the should it take the center stage um, and the space in the discourse of natural history writing and nature writing in India today. I knew she was going to get me into trouble. <laughs> I knew, that, I knew that there was going to be this, and I, I, I'm happy to answer as best I can. Um, yeah, the Cheetah Project, let me start with that. Just, I, I do have a chapter on Kunopalpur, which is where the cheetahs have been introduced. And um, I wrote it with a fair amount of trepidation, because uh, as we all know, the cheetahs, Reintroducing the cheetahs from Africa was is a controversial uh, subject amongst naturalists themselves, a wildlife scientist. There are many who think it's, it's simply a vanity project, and the money, the 50 crores or whatever it costs, could have been better spent saving some of the endangered species there are. And I tend to agree with that. But nevertheless, it's happened, uh, and we're we're stuck with it. But I think the the interesting part about it is also as soon as politics came into play and as soon as it was sort of propelled into this headline news you know cheetahs give birth uh, two cheetahs die you know you're constantly whenever I look on the I get the express on my um, laptop every morning and there was a while there where the cheetahs were uh, you know, they were almost as important as cricket matches uh, for a while there. But when the, the political gaze is applied to wildlife, uh, it can certainly be helpful, but I think in this particular instance, it made it much, much more difficult for uh, the Madhya Pradesh Forest Department to even begin to make this a success, because every step of the way it was being watched. Um, I think there is politics involved in conservation. We know that. Uh, we can't avoid that. And sometimes it helps when powerful people support uh, activities, um, projects that uh, help protect wildlife or protect wild places in that way. But there's always a flip side, because with politics, uh, there's always payback. There's always payback in that way. And so the wildlife scientists who are trying to get those cheetahs to take hold there, um, some have paid with their careers. Um, others are under enormous pressure. So it it is, um, it's a, volatile mix, just like religion and politics is a uh, volatile mix, conservation and politics is equally. And it didn't just start with the cheetahs. I mean, Indira Gandhi's uh, relationship with wildlife, I mean, she is certainly credited with uh, giving the backbone to uh, the Wildlife Protection Act in 72, Project Tiger, and all of that. Um, but uh, there are a lot of things that her government did that are questionable from a conservation point of view. So it's a mixed bag. Did I get myself into trouble or not? Am I right? <laughs> One could argue, well, the, national, uh, the Indian National Board had seeded the idea of the Cheetah Project in, I think, 1952. 52, yeah. 52, yeah. Yeah, they'd been wanting to do it for a very long for a time. Very long time yeah. And uh, they wanted to actually bring Asiatic cheetahs from Iran. But Iran has a... Sh 
desperately shrinking population. I think right now there are probably about 20 or 30 of them left. So that might have had some justification. But bringing them all the way from Africa, I mean, I'm being honest, there are a whole lot of better ways to spend money on conservation than bringing an exotic species and creating a another venue for safari uh, parks. Thank you. So, uh, like moving away also from uh, some of the flagship species, uh, moving away from cheetahs, tigers, and um, other species, you've also covered a lot of uh, smaller um, and lesser known species and traversed a lot of uh, diverse landscapes. I just wanted to get uh, your perspective on do you feel that there are any landscapes you may have missed and would have wanted to add in retrospect? Oh, I, yes. I mean, this book is not comprehensive by any uh, measure. And uh, the, the interesting thing was while I was working on it, people would say, well, you must go here, you must go there. And uh, there are an enormous number of places that I've missed out on. Uh, maybe there'll be a volume two if, uh, if my publishers uh, think it's something I should do. I'm not sure. It, it, for me, it's an excuse to go to places that I want to go. And uh, I get to write about them, which which is nice also. So yeah, there are many places I would love to go. Kerala, I didn't cover uh, in this. Tamil Nadu, I touched on very little. I did go to Mahabalipuram, but that was about it. Um, and um, I don't think you would run out of places uh, to visit uh, in India and the variety of landscapes that are there. And then, as you say, looking at the smaller species uh, the less uh, charismatic species often is much more rewarding because if you go again looking for tigers, you're going to see a saffron blur going into the bushes. Um, but if you look at um, uh, scorpions, for example, uh, there's all sorts of exciting stuff to look at. I mean, one of the exciting discoveries with Omkar was the uh, if you use an ultraviolet torch, the scorpions glow in the dark and uh, going with, suddenly you know you pitch black uh, wet dripping rain all this sort of thing and he's switched on the torch and there were two dozen claws and tails waiting for me just inches away and it, it was magical magical really so I, like when I was reading your book there's also a very visceral sense of just being in these landscapes and feeling uh, some of these landscapes. And sometimes I also feel like uh, being a wildlife scientist and a wildlife biologist, while I do have some of those uh, experiences, um, capturing the lived realities of what uh, that is seems so far removed from the demands of what we need to do. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts about um, what is there um, a, a space for people to be like part-time nature writers, or is this a full-time immersion, or how do you uh, balance like lived realities and also writing? Oh, I, I think there's definitely space for anything and everything. What, what, and I do have to make it absolutely clear that I'm, I'm a, an amateur naturalist, and unlike wildlife scientists who, and you spend months and months in. Uh, uh, in Arunachal and other places like that. Somebody who's studying swamp deer is going to spend years in the field and all of that. I don't. Uh, I'm, I, I drop in and I drop out. But hopefully I drop into enough interesting places that I get the stories to be there. But yeah, I don't think anybody should feel that um, bird watching is, is only for those people that know Latin. Um, and Bird watching is something that you can do any time of the day, yeah. and uh, briefly or uh, full time. So I just thought I'll read a few uh, things in the book that I thought were particularly evocative to me. Uh, so I would quote, this is like one of my last two questions. Um, so I'll read this uh, last, the last chapter. 
So when a naturalist see, when naturalists seek out and observe both rare and familiar species, they try to see the living world for what it is, but also for what it represents. Watching an insect, bird, mammal, or reptile, we contemplate the marvelous order and chaos of life as it has evolved over millions of years. And yet what often inspires us more than anything else are those fleeting, intimate moments in which we see a wild creature looking back at us with a shared awareness of our mutual presence. As our eyes meet the other's gaze, it reaffirms the simple fact that we as a species are not alone on this earth. Um, so as my concluding question, I just wanted to ask you, so what did you recognize in yourself when you watch some of these species? Well, I, I always joke, when I saw the lion-tailed macaque in the, um, uh, near Agumbe in the Western Ghats here, I saw an old man with white hair. Um, and uh, it, it, there was something definitely uh, familiar about <laughs> that, that creature's face. Uh, what I wondered was, does he see something familiar in me when he's looking at me. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But I think that what, what you read, thank you for reading that short passage, I think one of the things that um, I realized over the course of writing the book was that there are many, many stories to be told uh, with regard to one or two uh, or a dozen different species. Uh, there is, of course, the scientific story. Science is really just storytelling. And it tells us about the evolution of that species. It tells us about the morphology, behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one layer of storytelling. And as you observe a species, you pick up on that narrative there. But then there is a whole other layer of narratives which are perhaps connected to mythology. Uh, or folklore, uh, sometimes stories that are very specific to that uh, region, whether it's the Churel uh, Papri or the Bandakiroti or whatever it may be, that name may be just within a small area there. Then there's the personal narrative, which is there as well. And weaving in your personal narrative as a nature writer is equally important. You don't want to make it all about yourself, but you do want to convey to your readers um, how you yourself encountered and experienced those species. And connected to that, I, I'm not a spiritual person. I, I'm, I'm an atheist, but I, I'm fascinated by the sacred. I'm fascinated by um, the mystical experiences that are there. And I've always felt that the mystical experiences, spiritual narratives, come out of a combination of fear and awe. So when you see a cobra, you're afraid, but you're also absolutely awestruck by this beautiful creature. And it's that connection that I feel is at the heart of animism and probably at the heart of most faiths. I, I use the other example is when you're in the mountains, uh, you look, you're standing on a cliff, and you're looking out at this beautiful panorama of snow peaks, and you're awestruck by that. And then you look down below your boots, and there's a thousand foot drop, and you're absolutely shit scared. So that combination of fear and awe is at the heart of mystical experiences. And you can, you can transpose that onto almost any other species. So when you ask me what's my own response, it's, it's the science is there, the mythology is there, the folklore is there, but then there is this other experience which you might call mystical or uh, spiritual, which is again part of our connection to nature. So on that note, I'd just like to say thanks to you, Stephen. And as you said, thanks for sharing your ecological truths through this journey of uh, traversing India's wildlands and the Himalayas. Thank you, Nandita. Thank you. We're not done. We're not done. Just question from the audience. Oh. We're not done. We're not done. We're not done. Nandini is used to ending things by herself. Um, <laughs> so questions from the audience? Please. 
Yeah, this is uh, even uh, it's not so much of a question, but uh, it piqued it piqued my interest when you you talked about the encounter, and I recently met a shaman from South America, and he said the warriors there they take ayahuasca, so that when they encounter the animal, their ego is not there because that interferes with the whole process of even when they kill them so um, and and when you said about you know how the how the animal thinks so that that really it was very interesting for me uh, because uh, when i was thinking about it i can't think how the animal thinks because i can't perceive how a being would think without an ego so i i mean that way yeah, i am so uh, the, this whole point of consciousness was was a very interesting point. No, thank you. That's that's an interesting way to look at it. And uh, yeah, and and if if some hallucinogenic plant helps along the way, why not? Why not? <laughs> uh, hi, I had a very interesting uh, session. Uh, I'd like your comments on uh, you know I saw see uh, some the, uh, an animal. Uh, pro program on TV and this scientist was uh, somewhere in South America Mike. somewhere in South America and he was uh, looking for this particular frog and it was a very rare uh, species a very tiny thing and he finally found it and he finally found he found the frog so he he took it to the lab so what's your uh, opinion on you know removing a species from uh, such a you know um, what do you call it uh, yeah. What do you put as a word? Habitat. Habitat. And uh, you know, taking it all the way to a lab somewhere, what is your opinion on this sort of intervention? Well, I think fortunately we've reached a point where collecting specimens, except in the instance of uh, new species, uh, is not necessary at all. There was a time, I mean, when I was a boy and we were taught biology, a big part of our lessons were going out and collecting uh, plants, birds, butterflies, beetles, whatever it may be. So I think we've reached a point now where science has described these species adequately. So we don't need to, you can take a picture of a butterfly, you don't need to catch it in a net and pin it uh, to, to a board anymore. Um, but I do think that wildlife scientists, if they are describing a new species, they, they need a holotype uh, for comparison. They need genetic material to, uh, you know, uh, analyze the provenance of that particular species and so on and so forth. So there is a space for that. Uh, but I think scientists have become much more um, cautious and are much less likely now to uh, take anything but the minimal required uh, in terms of specimens like that. Um, I'm not sure whether that answers your question. I, I'm not somebody who would say, no, absolutely no collecting. It would be nice to say that, but I don't think uh, wildlife science can um, progress unless uh, there, there is a certain element of collecting going on, whether it's with moths, or um, other species like that. But certainly, what I, what I will say is, it's always better to see that species in its natural habitat. There's no question about it. And that's why I enjoy going out in the forest rather than going to a zoo. Uh, it, I mean, a zoo is an artificial experience, whereas if you see something in Netra Valley uh, Wildlife Sanctuary, you're actually seeing it in situation like that, yeah. I think we have another question from Aarti. Uh, so you spoke about uh, spiritual connections and nature. And in India, have we, we have a strong tradition of nature worship. So do you think it could be a better step uh, if we uh, talk about those stories? It will help in conservation aspect if we share those stories on a more wider platform? Absolutely. And I think... Um, I mean, one of the things that I, I was interested in in the process of working on this book was sacred groves. And I'd heard a lot about sacred groves, but I had not really experienced uh, many of them. Um, and uh, 
here in Goa, I visited, uh, I don't think Omkar wanted me to see as many sacred groves as I made him take, take me to, but we did see quite a few. And then in Karnataka, um, uh, and then in Kurg, in Kodagu, uh, we also visited a number there. And it was fascinating to see the similarities between these different uh, sites. Uh, because to me, they speak of a, what I would call a, a sort of indigenous conservation ethic, the idea that there is a space that needs to be protected and needs to be sacrosanct. Um, it was interesting that one of the people that's done a lot of work on sacred groves is, of course, Madhav Godgil. And I met him in Pune, and he was telling me that you know Goa has so many sacred groves, partly because the Portuguese didn't have the forest uh, uh, laws that the rest of the country had. So they were more willing to allow local communities uh, jurisdiction over those particular areas. And it's true. I mean, Goa, you'll, uh, there, there are an awful lot, almost as many as there are in Kodugu that there. But yeah. there were sacred groves in um, uh, near Shillong, in Meghalaya, uh, just outside Delhi. Uh, there's a place called Mangarbani, which is right between Gurgaon and Faridabad, and there's a wonderful sacred grove there uh, that the Gujar community maintains. Um, and uh, you know, you're you're in the midst of all of these high rises and garbage dumps and all of that sort of thing. And then there's this wonderful forest there that somebody decided has to be protected, and a community believes in that and they maintain it. Any more questions? Uh, yes, of course. A clue from you. Uh, sometimes going for a name or name change also helps. Like in Andaman's case, uh, researchers, they suggested and we did it. Uh, the dugong is known locally is known as Samudri Suar because of the that right. snout. Right. So they said Ki, let's call it start calling it Samudri Gai. And that really helped us in actually giving some protection <laughs> locally. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. I, I I'm glad to hear that. But it is called the sea cow in other places, right? So it's just uh, it transposed the name. This has been amazing this has been an amazing session. This has been an amazing session, and in many ways, it leads us to the next one. Um, we've been, we've been talking about Steve's new book, which I strongly urge you to get. But in many ways, I have several favorite books uh, uh, of his. I started off by mentioning one called All the Way Up to Heaven, but one that I highly recommend to all of you is called Becoming a Mountain, and it's a very profound book, um, which is which is a kind of. Uh, what uh, I, I there all the labels are going to be wrong, so forgive me. But uh, but the, the great uh, Jose Pereira, who's a who's a who's an intellectual from here, talked about Angelo Fonseca's art as being something that is eco eco or uh, eco theological, something like that. He said uh, eco theological, and and uh, that book really is about the bhakti of nature, the bhakti of the Himalayas, and it is a tremendous book for that reason it is a it is a treasure even if it's not understood as such it is a, it is a trend treasure of indian letters and so is uh, so is mr steve walter thank you so much nandini velio thank you very much mr steve stephen alter for this amazing session thank you so much and please keep your seats for behold the word is god hymns of tukaram translated by shanta gokhale and jerry pinto and they will be, he will be an interaction. Jerry promises to not only read, but also we dance. And there will be music and singing. And please proceed from there. Thank you so much, Nandini and Steve.